please welcome Director Sylvia Matthews Burrell, Office of Management and Budget, with Stephen Ratner, Economic Analyst for MSNBC's Morning Joe. Good morning. Um, thanks so much to Sylvia Matthews Burwell for joining us today, Madam Director. Appreciate you being here. Um, would like to start, I know that uh, the agency that you run has, does not have the initials HHS, but given the news of the day, I think we do, if you don't mind, need to start a bit with health care and particularly with President Clinton's comments yesterday about what changes should be made to the Affordable Care Act to allow people to keep all of their insurance. I think Jay Carney had some things to say that were a little bit different love to have you help us understand how the White House is thinking about this. So I think uh, my former boss's comments and my current boss's comments, actually, they both agree on a couple fundamental things. And one is the overarching importance of health care. And we'll come back to that. But with regard to the specific issue, I think what you're referring to, which is the issue of the question of cancellations, I think both the president himself has spoken uh, to the fact that he is hopeful and has directed the administration to look for administrative solutions. And I think President Clinton was saying uh, the same thing that you need to find and look for a solution to that problem. Although I think they, I think they might have been saying slightly different things, because you just used the word administrative solutions, and President Clinton said if we need to change the law, we should change the law. I think that uh, what President Clinton said was that he believed you need to find a solution if that is what you need to do. I think first and foremost, you want to try and exhaust remedy with regard to can you fix something administratively. And then, so, right, and I, does President Obama agree with that, that if you can't solve it administratively, you could go back to the Hill to change the law? Right now, where we stand is that the administration is looking for that administrative solution, and that's what the president has directed, and that's what we're working on. And is the solution you're looking for the one that President Clinton said, which is that anyone who wants to keep their insurance can, because what I heard at least Jay Carney say yesterday was that if people are having trouble paying for the new insurance, you'd like to find ways to help them, which I took to be something slightly different. I think when one thinks about the issue of uh, cancellations, there are a broad range of different approaches that you can take. So we're, we don't know yet. Uh, we've been directed <laughs> to find an answer. OK. Uh, a couple, just one or two more things on that, and then we'll move on to your, uh, your real day job. Um, Beyond the issues of the website, beyond the issue, well, not beyond the issue that we were just talking about, because that's actually central to this, my understanding of the Affordable Care Act is that it's, to make it work, it's critical to have the requisite number of people, including healthy young people, sign up for the program so that as the risk pool measures change, people are getting insurance at the prices that have been projected. Do you expect that when we get done with all this, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, those pools will look the way they're supposed to look and people will be getting what they're supposed to get in terms of cost of insurance. Yes, I do feel that. And I think when talking about the Affordable Care Act, one of the things that's very important is actually to start with where we are now as a nation and what this is about. And I think that gets lost in a lot of the conversations we're currently having about this issue. In our nation right now, depending on whose numbers you look at, between 40 and 55 million Americans, and a high percentage of those to the tune of possibly, depending on whose numbers you use, 70% of those are working Americans who don't have affordable health care. That's the state of play. For many people in this room, you may have your health care through an employer or another means. But for those that are in that individual market, many of those that are working Americans, what they face on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of how their health care, how they can either not afford it, can't get it, the conditions under which they do it, um, are highly constrained. In addition, even we, people who are lucky enough to have uh, employer-based health care, sometimes face things like pre-existing conditions. There are issues of what happens when your child is that out of college up to 26 and that has been fixed. So there are a whole range of issues that the Affordable Care Act is about in the current marketplace and what is happening. The second thing is the issue of health care costs and whether that's for the federal government or the cost in the private market. Having just come uh, before I was in government with a private sector firm, those questions of health care costs are very real. And so the Affordable Care Act was about addressing both of those pieces. Progress is being made 
on the issue of those overarching costs. Whether it's overarching healthcare inflation, which we've seen at some of the lowest levels uh, in 2010, adjusted for inflation, it was about 1.7 percent. Also, we see CBO reporting that the growth in fee-for-services in Medicare, that's on the government side of what the government's spending, we're seeing that declining. So we're starting to make some progress. You're referring to that piece, which is, will the economics work and will you get the product? And I think we believe and are seeing that there will be a system that can do that. And you saw that with some of the premiums that uh, insurers came in with. And one other aspect of this, and then we will move on. But assuming even that it all works as planned, one other thing that may, people may not have understood a few months ago, I think beginning to understand, is that even under the best of circumstances, there are people who are going to be paying more for insurance than they would have before because the nature of the risk pools have changed, because of the requirements that every insurance plan have that set of features that we've been hearing a lot about and so forth, right? Um, I think that that depends. One of the things that's getting lost in the current debate uh, that I think is very hard to unwind analytically, but when you articulate it, you understand it. So everyone today in the current conversation are comparing premiums. But for any of you who are actually proximate to your health care, and you know, okay, so first there's the issue of premium. Then there's the issue of deductible. Then there's the issue of out-of-pockets. Then there's the issue of co-pays. And then for some of you, who have a plan with limits, oh gosh, it's a bad year and I had to have an MRI and I have to go over, there's the cost of that which you'd put in out of pocket. So the question of exactly what that's going to look like, I think we're going to take some time to have to see and understand. But right now, our tool is a pretty blunt instrument with regard to how people ask that question and I think it's important to expand it. Fair enough. So let's turn to something that was not in the newspapers today but is near and dear to your heart and important. I think today the Senate House Conference Committee on the Budget is having its second meeting, having not had a meeting in about 10 days and with a month to go till the deadline, no visible sign of progress, huge differences between the, ho the Senate budget and the House budget, no enforcing mechanism like we had with sequester, which didn't work anyway, but at least it was an enforcing mechanism. What's your, why should any of us believe that there's going to be a budget out of this process? So I think, uh, first of all, uh, one of the positive steps is a movement back towards regular order. So the fact that we're even having a conversation about a conference, which means actually that the House and the Senate have two pieces or two pieces of legislation that needs to come together and get to a place. That's step one in terms of something. That's a step forward from where we were, um, certainly uh, before the shutdown. So that's a positive step in the right direction. I think the other reason that one can have hope is I think generally speaking across the board, both Democrats and Republicans do believe that sequestration is not the best way to approach discretionary spending in the federal government. And so those are two things that I think there is general agreement on, and that there is a desire for somewhat of a return to regular order. Those are the things that are pushing in the positive direction. And I think as your question reflects, there are things pushing in the opposite direction. But when you ask for what are reasons for hope, I think those are two very important ones. Fair enough. So let's talk about some of the things pushing in the opposite direction. One of them is the question of revenues. I think your position is that any budget deal should include some measure of revenues, but perhaps you can... Say it in your own words, rather than my say it for you. So when the president put out a budget, and this was actually before I had even, uh, as I was returning to government, the budget had um, elements to it that were, the president's budget is his uh, view of how we as a nation can come together on having strong fiscal policy that's about growth, long-term deficit, deficit reduction, and a discretionary spending policy that is not as austere in the short term that will help us with the current recovery. That approach had different pieces to it. It had pieces of revenue, and it had pieces of long-term entitlement reform, what we refer to as a balanced approach to doing that long-term deficit reduction, investing in the kind of growth that we need, both in the short term and the long term, and making sure that right now, as we think about how we do discretionary spending, we do it in a way that encourages the current recovery. And so that was the balanced approach that is in the President's budget that we support in the form of big or small. So I think what I may be hearing you say, so the Republicans are saying about revenues, no, 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 and furthermore, no. You're saying we're not quite as dug in on entitlements as they may be on revenues. We want to fix sequester. You're also suggesting even they want to fix sequester. So it sounds like you may think there's a deal there, that you're willing to make these painful from the standpoint of at least Democratic constituencies, changes in some entitlements. 
you get them to do some stuff on revenues and you make some changes in sequester? Is that the deal we should look for? I think that what uh, one needs to think about is what are the changes that one needs to make depending on the size or magnitude. So what you're willing to do has to do with the size and magnitude. I was referring to the broad overarching uh, proposal, and so we're clear about what that proposal was. That proposal was a proposal that would do $1.2 trillion of sequester replacement and an additional $600 billion in deficit reduction. That's huge. I think by anyone's standards, uh, when you think that we already have put in place $2.5 trillion worth of deficit reduction before we even have a conversation about the sequester. And when you add that to it, that's very big. One's willingness to do things that are hard and tough. And in the President's budget, there are things that would not be this administration's first choice. Uh, and many of those we were criticized for, um, certainly for putting out. But when you have to, if you're going to talk about doing things like entitlement reform, you have to do a certain level and magnitude of revenue. So if we were having this conversation a year from now, give us your prediction. Will there be no deal? Will there be a small deal? Will there be something like what you just talked about, which would obviously be a big deal? Um, I wish I had that crystal ball. Uh, I wish I had that crystal ball for, for many reasons in many ways in terms of being able to predict exactly where we'll be. But I think one of the things, and one of the things that is happening here in Washington, D.C., is you know the predictability of what is going to happen in terms of I probably would not have predicted a shutdown, uh, you know, to be honest. And so one's predictability at this point, I think what you need to do and what we're doing instead of doing things like predictions is try and make yourself as ready as possible and create the environment and the places and steps to make sure that a deal can happen of either size if you, if you can possibly get it. And some of those things are making sure we're clear about principles. You can't solve defense without non-defense. We think a balanced approach is an important approach, what I just previously described. We think that living at 967, which is the lower level, this is the level of funding with sequestration, is not the place to be. I think we think the second thing is supporting the processes as they're set up or as they're going to work. And sometimes that evolves and changes. As we saw in the shutdown, that was really a process about leadership. Now we actually have a conference approach. And so being flexible and ready to support any approach to maximize the chance that you are going to get something. So let's talk about sequester just for one more minute. Uh, you've had, I think, three years of declining spending on discretionary, domestic discretionary. You mentioned 967 as the current spending level. I think President Obama's first budget had something like 1.4 trillion, if you go back to 09, of where he thought we would be now. But yet, on the other hand, you see people, Republicans, not just Republicans, but a lot of people saying, well, the government, you know, a trillion dollars, you ought to be able to cut 5 percent. I don't see the impact. The world hasn't ended. Life has been going on. From where you're sitting, can you give us some real-life specific examples that come across your desk of how sequester is hurting the country? Uh, yes. Everything from, let's start with in terms of uh, the furloughs that occurred. Uh, in, in different agencies. And so actually at the Office of Management and Budget, we had more furloughs than anyone had. And so we actually had eight furlough days. Uh, and then when you add in the shutdown, our ability to deliver in terms of the overarching government management as well as putting budget together. 56,000 children uh, were kicked off of Head Start last year because of the sequester. And another 30,000 instructors for Head Start um, saw the ramifications of sequester, either in lowered pay, fewer hours, or some were even released. Another uh, implication of sequester is readiness. And so when we think about our own national security, the issues of readiness fell greatly during uh, that sort of fall period, August, September. What we saw is the number of Air Force units training had dropped dramatically. Across the board, what this means in terms of our ability to be ready as a nation if we need to call upon our services. Those are some of the types of examples that uh, come to mind, as well as research. So the number of grants that the National Science Foundation uh, and the NIH are able to do continue to decline. That has ramifications for the here and now in terms of the research that's ongoing. It has long-term ramifications because we are discouraging American scientists from going into different fields because they don't feel it's safe and secure. 
they don't feel there'll be a path for them to get their research funded. So there are the short-term things and there are the long-term things. In this past year, what you saw at, the, at, at different departments is everyone was cleaning out the couches, you know, searching for the uh, coins under the cushions, and at the same time doing things like eating your seed corn. We've all delayed IT investments. You know, those are the types of things that you do. You delay certain types of changes in order to have the money up front. Those are some examples, Steve. Um, let me spend our last couple of minutes on the longer, medium and longer term issues. Uh, your former colleague, my former boss, Larry Summers, has been saying a lot about the budget. And one of the things he said was that while there might need to be fiscal adjustments in the medium to long term, the need is much less certain than most suggest. Do you agree with him? What I think is that there are three basic things we need. We need growth, we need long-term deficit reduction, and we need to reduce a bit of the fiscal austerity that we have right now in terms of the way the sequester is being implemented. So I think until I would sit down and talk to Larry, because I think the question is, is how do you feel about that, those issues of long-term deficit reduction? In that package I just described, that uh, 1.2 trillion plus the 600 billion, you see elements of long-term deficit reduction, some of which are targeted to changing the way that in incentives in healthcare spending, so we have those long-term reductions. But what, one of the things Larry has said is that if you add a half a percent a year to the growth of GDP, the long-term deficit problem goes away without doing all those things. I think one of the, th first of all, Adding a half a percent to the GDP uh, would be a, a, a welcome <laughs> under any situation, under any scenario. And I think we fundamentally believe that right now we have a drag on the economy. And the drag uh, comes from, number one, the sequester, and number two, vast amounts of political uncertainty that negatively impact. So certainly, at a minimum, absolutely agree with Larry. Let's do everything we can to get the nation on a growth trajectory, because that is the easiest way to go. But you think we need to do the longer-term things to make I think one has to keep one's eye on these long-term balls, that that's the responsible thing to do. Having had the opportunity when I was here before to work on actually balanced budgets. Uh, when I was at the Office of Management and Budget last time, worked on what was the first black budget, uh, budget in the black in 30 years. I think those things are important, but what's important is not whether it's balanced, what's not uh, specific numbers. What's important is keeping your eye on the ball of basic growth of the economy in the short term and the long term. That's about what's happening now, and it's about investments for the long term. Like some of the energy investments that the Department of Energy made many years ago, we're seeing the benefits of as a nation. Some of the fracking and that, that sort of thing, research around different types of energy investments. And so we need to keep our eye on both balls and make those investments. And it's not about one thing or another, but about where we are. And I think that's Larry's point, is right now we need to focus on growth. And on that point, I fundamentally agree with Larry. Fair enough. So you gave me a segue into my last question, which was when you alluded to the fact that you were here under Clinton in what some people now look back on as the halcyon days when things actually got done in Washington. And then you went off for 15 years and you did literally God's work. And now you're back into this situation, for lack of a better way to describe it. So give us your impressions. Is it really much worse than it was back then? Or are we remembering the past a little too fondly? So I think that you know some of the issues and the, the framing of the issues, what I just described is what you need to focus on is still what you need to focus on, and and that was that you know the same then and it is uh, the same now in terms of these broad issues. But I think there are some differences. The magnitude of the problem is greater. When you think about deficits in the 95-96 period, you're talking about anywhere from 105 to 164 billion. We started this year at a trillion. Good news is we're down to 680 in terms of the deficit, 680 billion. But the magnitude of the problem is harder. The other thing that is more challenging is when the other side is split in its point of view. That does create challenges. And the general atmosphere, the whole sense that it's so toxic here and so dysfunctional and nothing is getting done, is that all a valid way to feel about Washington compared to what you remember from the Clinton years? You know, in this town, things do take some time. And after six months, I'm not willing to go uh, there completely. I am willing to say it is more difficult when you are when you have things that are split in terms of what we just saw with regard to some people having a different point of view about shutdown and the fact that anyone could even think of using uh, the nation's good credit as a bargaining chip. And that is more difficult. On that happy note, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Sylvia Matthews Burwell, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks so much.